How many do you have to choose? Four. So buy one yourself. The way I would run. Choose one. On Thursday, you invite me twice. I want good assets for this first asset. And I'll tell you one more thing you need, and I'll kind of tell you what you're going to have in class tomorrow. If you have any questions over the essays, please let me know. Okay, if somebody has analyzed, I was going to make a change, and I changed it back. I have no idea how this happened. Does anyone have their second question? Analyze the factors, three factors. Anyone have that? It's so weird. I changed my essay. I'll put three back. No, I just put factors. And for somehow, I got it messed up in my car. Really weird. Does everyone have analyze the factors of the industrial revolution? For the second one? Yeah. Everyone have that? Analyze? Okay. They're cool. All right. So you have to pick one of these. Yes, they're close to what we have, but you notice I did not put the fact, I put analyze factors of. So things that came out of the industrial revolution, they're tied into, you can't have anything with the transportation revolution, capitalism, which are kind of the big keys, but also innovation, the changing family, you have lots of stuff in there. There's lots of things. Family, we're gonna go through a bunch of different changes of the family. And the turning point, just talk about how the American society changed, which we have everything from a new economic system to the railroad and Christmas. We'll come to that. And so, this is the essay you're gonna have. Please look at it tonight so if you have any questions on it. So why is your phone out? You're putting it away, right? You're not back in Hamilton. You're here. Uh, okay, there was somebody walking just by the window. I thought there's a floating cat out there. I just saw that cat bouncing up and down in the window. Okay, let's talk about your opening paragraph in your essay. So you might want to jot down a few of these things or take your notes out just to review. We are talking about thesis statement. We'll do another thesis statement before. If you want me to look at your thesis statement, I will look at it. Or you can send it on Teams. The only problem with sending it on Teams, they now have a 24 hour limit for students messages on Teams if the data is small. I really am not sure why. Something happened that I don't know. I, mean, I don't really want to know. But this is the limitations we have. So if you send it, I'll try. I'll look tonight or tomorrow night, but I'm just letting you know it's 24 hour limit. Mine stay on forever. Yay. Actually, no, I don't think so. I think everyone's not limiting 24 hour chat. So something must have happened. But your opening paragraph. That's the first thing that someone's going to read. And what do you need in your opening paragraph? Well, I know a lot of people, especially for timed essays, you might get in a class and say, you know that opening sentence, make it a hook. You set the grab and suck them in. We all know how hard that is to write. Now, if something hits you for that first sentence, fine. But this is a timed essay we have to do in here. And so just make it something very basic for that first sentence. There were many changes in the 19th century, 19th century in America. Be really basic. Unless something hits you that's really good. It might, I don't know, but we don't have time, especially in a timed essay. But here's the next thing about that opening paragraph you need. What you need is, and the word is, okay, no one like the green pens, so I wrote it in blue, context. Context, which is background material. Now, some of you already know what it is, but I just wanna make sure this is clear. Events that are happening outside of your essay. So events that led up to the Industrial Revolution, like the War of 1812, or the Industrial Revolution uh, began in Britain. Or another way to look at it is, put down two to three specific events, people, events, and places that you do not have in your body paragraphs. If you don't have a paragraph on the transportation revolution. I'm just throwing something out there. Mention it in your context. A radically changing transportation revolution that lowered shipping costs in that opening paragraph. Context. Two to three, maybe four sentences that have these things down. Just a sentence about it. 
If you don't talk about the changing family, mention it there. The second great awakening, mention it there. The new dem dem democratic movements, mention it there. So two to three, you can get there, but events outside the scope of your essay. So events happening outside of that, context, that's background material. You need that for two big reasons. First off, you're telling the person reading your essay, I'm smart, I know my stuff, I know the material. You're kind of showing off, but it lays out the fact that this is a confident, well-written essay. I, I know what's going on. Secondly, you gotta be pragmatic. Context is one point on your essay. So on the, the regular long essay, six points, you get context, that's, that's one point. You get a good thesis statement, that's two. That's two out of six. For the DBQ, document-based questions, which we'll get to uh, fairly soon, seven points, that's two of your seven. Like a well-organized essay, which is also your thesis at the point two, so you're like halfway home if you get that. Remember what I told you, you write a good essay, they'll figure out a way to give you, give you the points. Make it easy for them to get. So contents, background material. So if you're doing the factors of the Industrial Revolution, and you have like a paragraph on transportation, on capitalism and innovation, I'm just throwing three things out of it. They might think, oh, that's a good idea, why not? But then write about two or three other things that happen during that time. Background material. The dramatic change in society with a new religious second great awakening. You know, things like that. Do not, for context, write things like, there have been many changes in American society from ancient Rome all the way to the 20th century, computers and cars. No, don't write that. Give me specific events about the era the essay is in. If you start writing stuff like that, in my life, I've seen so many things. I have changed so much because of the Industrial Revolution. That looks like to the person right, reading your essay that you're just filming stuff. You're just writing stuff. There's an initial for this, D and an S. Everybody's done it, essay, and it's easy to catch. You might get away with it occasionally. But you just start writing stuff like that, just generic garbage. They catch them. So what's the closing? A couple sentences showing how you prove your thesis. Maybe one more piece of context. That's all the closing is. Show how you answer your thesis. You can give an example, just kind of restate it again. Don't write the thesis again, but I'm sorry, I proved it. One more bit of context. That's it. That's all the closing is. What's the least important paragraph in a timed essay? You got to skimp on one, skimp on the other. You got to skimp on it. Running out of time, get the body, get the opening. Sound good? That's not That's all it is. You want to just write the essay now? Please look at it. Think about it. Think about context if you have any questions. That's all this. Tomorrow I'll show you the outline where you bring the class. Thursday, you'll come in, you'll sit down, you'll write. I'll throw things at you while you're right. I think a little bit of danger adds to the element of your essay. I get, I get something exciting then. Pen or pencil? Black or blue pen, no ink or flat or white pen. But I will repeat, writing with a pen, it's easier for long. Francisco. No mistakes, but it, it is easy. And AP exam, we got to do everything handwritten. So we will do it second semester, everything in pen, but start transitioning to pen, just getting used to it. It really does make a difference. All right, so where did we get to? We get to, we got right to here, right? Oh, perfect. So what is it called where big as a competitive advantage? What is that called? The economic term for big having a competitive advantage to the market. Hmm? Economies of scale, the iron rule of economics. Economies of scale, they're more efficient. And 
all companies want to limit competition and they want to achieve something that operates like a what? And what is the term for anti-monopoly by government? In the United States, we call it anti-what? Yeah, a weird way to do it in the United States. I'll tell you about that when we get after the Civil War. Why trust became, that became the word. Just as a historical quirk. And, oh, what decides wages? Yeah, the market, supply and demand. If profits go up, what happens to wages? Has no direct effect. Profits have no direct effect. And we have two classes being created in capitalism. Who are the people who own the capital? They're called the... What, what is it? Capitalist or bourgeoisie. And then labor are also called what? Yeah, the proletariat. So I think we got, so families were consumers. Pay was based upon what? Before 1815, pay was based upon what? Say it again. Well, kind of, it's skill. Hard, hard work skill, which I guess you could argue would be merit. Yeah. And you kind of decide. Who, who, where is production done? What do we call it where production is done in home? Another name for cottage industry. Putting out system. That's the putting out system. Here, did we get right to here? Is that right where we quit? Is that right? So consumers. So you got to buy everything. And this is a radical shift from you having to make it to where you buy it. No, it's not like 1816 also this happens. It's going to be over the rest of the century. And it's going to be radically different for people living here than here. So you still see a lot of the old economy in Montana. In a, in those people are coming in and taking the land there in 1870s, 1880s. So this is a gradual process, but it is our world today. And the factory system now, no longer are there putting out to industries, it is owned, or you have to go to where the capital is, under one roof. That means people are going to start living closer to the factories. It's no coincidence that urbanization is going to follow. Not only that, who's in charge? Workers are no longer independent, as independent. It's the merchant capitalists. And the workers now are dependent upon them. Somebody else, for the vast majority, almost every person today, they have to have somebody who has the capital for them to work to survive to become consumers. Now, I'm not saying the world before was not difficult and, and hard. In a lot of ways, it was a lot worse. In a lot of ways, though, well, independence. You, you have to weigh it. And then the wage system replaced skill as the most important thing, or hard work. Once again, really hard to adapt to. Are you going to accept this new world? And so with that, by the way, this is all changing family, isn't it? It's not just a factor of the Industrial Revolution. This is a new family being created. That's a hint for the essay. Two essays. Actually, three essays, really. All three of them. You can kind of do the same thing for all three. You just have to organize it differently. So the market revolution then is what this is going to be called. Well, if we call this recent, like in the last 20 or 30 years. You see this in various places, a lot of textbooks, but also things like the AP exam. So it's a term we need to know. What is the market revolution? All of these things that came out of the industrial revolution. I should have put the arrow the other way, but for some reason I put it, it should be like this way because of the new economic system, capitalism, the transportation revolution. And how finance, banking, buying and selling of stock, profiting from the selling of stock became so crucial. And this is a run on the bank, a bank panic in the panic of 1837. We'll get to that probably Thursday, Friday. And so with that, so if you see the market revolution, it is basically all these things that came out of the industrial revolution. And I should add, even people who were against or fearful of the Industrial Revolution, like Jefferson, they still liked the market, per se. They were just fearful of all the, the production being in the hands of the capitalists. So back to this. So now we have all these reactions. All these things are going to blow up. Can we, can we
can only just cover this a little bit. Um, it was short on the janitors last night, so you must not be able to get that. This is what is the movement for anti drinking culture? Remember that? Chapter 12. Say it again. Temperance. Yeah, the temperance movement. Now, temperance means to limit drinking. Prohibition is to totally get rid of it. And people drink a lot more. Everything changes with the Industrial Revolution. If now you're reliant upon cons your consumer economy, and therefore you need money to survive. If one person drinks in a family, that means less money for food for this is the drunkard's progress for them. And that's why she's crying. So this is supposed to represent like her husband drinking a little bit, soon to having fun and drinking, and then the decline of the drunkard's progress. Drunkenness, homeless, turning to robbery for money. The drunkard's progress. To try to get people to limit drinking. And yes, drinking will go down dramatically for lots of reasons. And so with that, family life got totally, totally changed. Families begin to move apart. Hey, with the mechanical reaper, you don't need as many kids. So they leave the household. So you're not going to get an entire family from like the grandparents all the way down to the grandchildren living right next to each other or in the same house. So you're going to get people separating and moving apart. This is a radical shift. Not that it didn't happen before, but it would become from being relatively unusual to the norm. I mean, all of you are probably thinking about the day you're going to move out. You know, and with an element of both, you know, anticipation and worry because it's a big shift, but it's kind of just accepted. It's going to happen someday. This was relatively new. Railroads would totally change how people connected and met. Marriages would change completely different. Think about if you live in a relatively rural area where you only know a few other families and they're probably all related. And limits are, well, let's put it this way. Got a lot of cousins marrying cousins. Not so much anymore. You can move to different towns. It totally changes your expectations of marriage and having and knowing somebody else. It also lessens the idea of a kind of an arranged marriage. Because you can meet somebody else. It changed the whole idea, a change in what uh, romantic love was. It just it was a big shift. Less horse-faced children, too, because you're not marrying cousins. Think about it. Also, married younger, a lot younger. Hey, once it's a consumer economy, your idea of kind of waiting to have that farm and Maybe perhaps when you can hear it from your parents or whatever it might be, that radically shifts to we got to get started now because we got to start making money now. And so you're going to see from instead of getting married late 20s, early 30s to early 20s to heck by the 1950s, we're talking teenagers getting married. Heck, in the 1950s, it, was, it became really common for girls to get married 16 and 17 years old. Which I. I think a lot are now thinking, I can't even comprehend that. And yeah, they couldn't really either. Also, more urban, which makes sense, right? More urban. Which, by the way, that means more government, more rules, more change. It means it's a radically changing world. Also, people's diet, clothing, sizes, where you bought, you didn't make it yourself. Everything, And then, like, furniture, you could now buy pre-made furniture, more furniture. A wallpaper became a really big deal, manufactured wallpaper. Heck, after the Civil War, if you had wallpaper with pineapples, you made it. You're big time. I, I forgot one more thing, too. Retirement. There was no retirement before the Industrial Revolution. Retirement is something that came about with the Industrial Revolution. You worked. Or before the Industrial Revolution, you worked until you couldn't work anymore. You probably your family care for you. It wasn't considered like a retirement. After it, there'll be a point where you can no longer have wage work, but you're still alive. It's a big shift. It totally changes your expectation of life. It's no coincidence that not long after the Industrial Revolution took place, the first country would have some kind of guaranteed pension for elderly people. They would 
passed this in their legislature. It, it was a new thing called the Reichstag. Country it was a brand new country called Germany. And they'd be the first one to have social security, old age pension. The United States would get that with um, the New Deal when Franklin was about during the 1930s. So at that, all this is new, totally new, totally changed. So with this, so with the changing family, women would be the most radical shit. Now women already have fewer economic and legal, or political and legal rights, but women dramatically lost economic value within the family. Before the Industrial Revolution, every single member of the family was vital for its survival. After the Industrial Revolution, more and more women, they became less important, therefore subservient to the man who would go off and get the wage. Now, women did this too, but more and more, it's the men. And remember, this was a gradual shift. And it was a real noticeable shift that women could feel. They lost economic value because they were no longer as important in a consumer economy. Remember, before the Industrial Revolution, women had to make everything. So therefore, women became more dependent upon men. It's part of the reason women started getting married younger, especially if children were married. Because children now it's different about the way children are raised for the Industrial Revolution. So, women became more dependent, and you can imagine there's going to be chafing with this, but at the same time, the women are going to lose economic and, I'm sorry, political and legal rights. There were states, especially in the North, where women with property could vote. That would be all gone by the 1830s. Gone. And by the 1850s, everyone forgot about it. That's up to a few, like, oh, remember when women could vote? No. Of course, a lot of men couldn't vote either. And legal rights, women lost legal rights, especially married women. Married women lost almost all their legal rights. By the end of the century, married women became little more than slaves to their husbands, owned by their husbands. They could have no money or wealth or property on their own. And it was as late as the 1980s that there were still a significant 1980s, a significant number of states where women um, could not like get a bank loan or put even a savings account or a checking account unless it was co-signed by their husband or signed a contract. In fact, that became the norm. You have to go after your husband. Now, 1980s not that long ago, especially in the whole context of time. And if there's somebody in your presence that was very much alive during that time. That means it wasn't that long ago. That'd be me if you're not sure. I'm the only one. So, this is a big shift, and women are going to fight against this. They want to have the options being created with capitalism because capitalism is an incredibly dynamic system. At the same time, they can feel the loss of power and rights. If you're dependent upon somebody else, you feel it. You're not independent. And so, while the husband works, there was a real question. What was the proper role of women? Now, before women were as essential as anybody else for the survival of the home. But this painting shows how it was a propaganda movement to tell women, this is your role. And what is your home? Where, where are women supposed to be? at home while their husband works. And look at this picture. Here she is working. Look how they're all, the kids are like, oh, daddy's home. And her job is to take care of them. One more thing I should add, cat lady day. Cat's doing cat things, because that's what cats do. Home sweet home. And what did they call this? They came up with a name to give it kind of this aura, where it's something beyond just a job. It is this special purpose for women, the cult of domesticity, the domestic life. And, or sometimes they call, they'll say, the fact that they said the cult of true womenhood, this is all womenhood, but we would say today, cult of true womanhood. Women aren't supposed to be working in factories or demanding things like the boat or 
legal rights. That's not, no, no, that's the grubby world that men exist in. They also call these middle class values. Why middle class values? Middle class, remember, those were the first ones where the husband would make enough for them to afford some of the trappings of an upper class life, and therefore the woman could stay home. So they basically created this from what upper class women kind of did. And they said that women now have one role in life. And this, but it's a wonderful role. And don't complain. Don't ask for higher wages if you work because you're not supposed to be working. What is their one role? To be a good one. That means a woman needs to get married, have and care for children, prepare the home for her husband who comes back from a hard day, and clean that house. Nobody cared if you had a clean house before the Industrial Revolution because you're surviving. Now you better have a clean house. And if a woman does anything other than that, there's something wrong with her. If a woman is not married, there's something wrong with her. If a woman wants something beyond this, there must be something wrong. Now, there were a lot of women who were working in families. There were a lot of women who had to take jobs because their family didn't have enough money. But this was the idealized role. Does everyone got that? Make sure you get this is the idealized. This is the way women should be. So the family's a failure if the woman has to work, and the woman is a, fa a failure, and I can't emphasize this enough, weird if she wants something beyond getting married in that show. There's something wrong with her. That's it. One choice. Now, you might say, how did this happen? Well, literally 20 years, this became like, oh, yeah, this way it's always been. But it wasn't like this. I should add. There were a whole series of women's magazines that would come out, edited by men, that would push this in this new, the new industrial system where they could make magazines going into the Civil War, the role of women. And these magazines would be huge all the way up until the 1980s and 90s. They're still around, like McCall's or things like that. So, what was the women's sphere? Home. That is their world. And they will teach morality and values to children. You see the women's sphere. This is my world. The husband goes off to the grubby, dirty world of finance, because that's what men do. They compete, they fight, while women are more sanctified, almost saintly. In fact, they would say they really emphasize the idea of pure. There's nobility of women. And you don't want to mess their hands up and their beauty up. We'll talk about that with this outside world. But the big thing about that is that tells women who do have jobs. There's something wrong with you. You should be at home. And therefore, don't ask for higher wages. Therefore, it dropped. This is a big deal. And the cult of domesticity would be huge, and it still is. I mean, think about any television ad or see an ad about TV or any place it might be about something about housework. Who's doing it? It's either always women or a man. It's kind of a joke doing it kind of badly. Not always, but that happens a lot. It's getting a little different, but call the domesticity. Wow, would this be big, especially after times of change. After times of change, times of insecurity. After World War II, it was almost like a manic effort to go back to that calling. And women should give up jobs they had during the war and get married and settle back. That's why 16 and 17 girls were getting married. They're almost manic to go back. So with this, this is a big shift. I can't emphasize well, what a big deal it is. When people talk about the old-fashioned role of the sexes, it's relatively new. And this ties in with this concept that began before the Industrial Revolution, but it's time to mention it here, called Republican Woman, where it's going to be the job of the women to teach their kids to be good citizens in a republic. And so here it goes off, the women, the man goes on, I'll take care of the important stuff. This is a relatively modern cartoon, but it says it pretty good. I will educate the children. Now, not quite this, but I'll come back to this. Now, I've got to mention Republican women, this has been on the APS a number of times. So I had to make sure all the domesticities almost always on there. 
Last year was a weird test. They didn't have like anything for the industrial revolution. Which are yeah, kind of like the biggest things that happened. <laughs> and uh, all the students came back and saw me on the next Monday or, or they sent me notes like, there are no questions from the Cold War. What? Only reason I'm telling you that is I wonder if that might be a good chance to be questions on the Cold War and this kind of stuff on the next step. Of course, you never know. They're, they're weird. Mm -hmm. So, what up, children? Speaking of family changes. Before the Industrial Revolution, for virtually every family, why did you have kids? Being workers. Kids, boom, out on the farm working, or whatever it might be. You might even know their name. I'm exaggerating, but not much. Kids are workers. At 10, 11 years old, they're working. Eight or nine, they're working. You have kids. After the Industrial Revolution, where you go from producers to consumers, why did kids? Why do you have kids? I have kids. But why do you have kids? Because you want kids and you love them. That's the point. Because you want kids. Before it was an economic necessity, you got to have kids. I know what you're saying, but why do you have kids? Now you got to. You got to really want them because you got to pay for them. It's a big shift. Kids before kind of workers, you know? But you gotta really make decisions in your life. When are you gonna have kids? You gotta have a job to pay for them. It's a big shift. What's gonna happen to the size of families once you have the Industrial Revolution? What? Yeah, they're going to go down because kids now are no longer an economic necessity. And you gotta make rational decisions about this. It's really difficult. But it's no coincidence then. If you're deciding, I'm gonna have kids because I wanna have kids, then you really want them and care for them and love them and give them names and feed them and clothe them and write this down. It's no coincidence. Industrial revolution. Why people have children would change. Public education. So write down education. You wanna educate them. I'm not saying you didn't before, but before you had no choice. For virtually every family, you had to go out and work. That's life. Now, public education. Now, once again, this is idealized. You know how much money, which about 20% of families did, the kids are in the factories too. But the idealized would be that someday they don't have to. But education. And then there's something else. If you have children, you want to be nice to them. Or the Industrial Revolution. Or the Industrial Revolution. The most pop, the most important, and still is the most important Christian holiday was what? Easter. By far. By far. There might have been a Christmas service, but Christmas was very sucky outside the realms of religion. In fact, that's why the Puritans would have, for example, ban it. Because it was literally a 12 or 7 day token mess. The first police force in the United States, permanent police force, was created in New York City, copy the London police force, and it was specifically started originally to stop Christmas. Because it would turn like they burned down buildings, it was just a mess. They tried to slow down Christmas. Within 40 years, the whole thing had changed. The whole thing had changed. Think about it. Children. I want to be nice to them. Maybe give them gifts. There are now factories making gifts who need demand. There's nothing wrong with giving gifts. In fact, I would argue giving gifts is a really nice thing. I like to give gifts to people. It feels good. I also like to receive gifts. You know, let's be honest. Yeah. No, but it goes from we have factories. Who want to sell products? We have families who want to be nice to children. Get together now. The holiday of Christmas as we know. Christmas will come about what way you think of Christmas now, especially the way it's thought around, uh, thought about all over the world. In areas that are not Christian, 
my brother always talks about when he was in, we, my brother used to have to go to China all the time for work. And he talks about being in Shanghai, where you know, the population of China is 99% not Christian, whatever. But there's Santa Claus everywhere. Why? Because it just became this gift giving, selling stuff. Heck, you go to the store, they're already having Christmas stuff. Up. Do you notice that? Halloween stuff is gone. The Christmas stuff is going up right now. You go to Target or what's my hand is running by because I'm pointing that direction. What what I'm at is Costco. It's Costco is like this consumerist paradise. There's gonna be Christmas stuff all over. The occasional turkey, but it's all related. So here's a Christmas celebration, that whole hanging the stockings. There were some elements of that, but that was kind of created. Have you heard of the night before Christmas and Christmas Carol, those stories? Those were created from whole cloth. They were literally just created, made up stories. The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens made it all up. Great story, but made up the story of Christmas. This Germanic Christmas tree, oh, that became all of a sudden associated with Christmas. Consumer demand, Christmas. What's the biggest time for stores? Christmas. Now, does it make it bad? But that's how it started, as we know it. And what about this guy? Santa Claus, as we know it, was a hodgepodge of different things, mostly Dutch Father Christmas. And Thomas Nast drew him this way. The chubby guy, eventually inside this week, red, with a beard, 1860s. Here it is by the Civil War. All created for the Industrial Revolution. So Christmas is another thing that came out with the Industrial Revolution. And I always think it's funny when people say, let's get back to the old fashioned traditional Christmas. Are you sure that's what you want? I don't think that is what you want. And there's one more thing. I, someone asked me this first person, so I'll tell you. Someone said, what about Xmas? What does that mean then? Is that like against Christmas or something? What does this mean, anyone know? Have you seen Xmas? Anyone know what this is? So Christianity really got its start in the Roman Empire. It was Greek. You might remember this from last year. And X is a, for the Greek letter, it's Christos. So that means, it just means Christmas. That's all it means. In fact, the first um, Christian cross was that, called the Chol wreath. Crucifixion's a lot of time. So yeah, that's all it means, it's just Christmas. So if you want to know, now you know. That's all it means is Christmas. It's just Another way of spelling it. So that's where, and I love this one. This is from Civil War, 1863, Harper's Magazine. And there was Santa Claus greeting the troops. All oh, this was brand new. And it's amazing how fast it became. It had always been, you know, people kind of forgot where it started and it just becomes tradition. That's the way traditions start. But almost every holiday that we celebrate today came on the Industrial Revolution. They became bigger, became more important. Halloween, partially because of this. Uh, Mother's and Father's Day, greeting card companies. Yeah. I, I, nothing wrong with that, but that's how they started. So, ironically, out of this, the women's rights movement would come. And so, we have to call the domesticity. Women are supposed to be this. Well, middle class women, the first ones who are like, this kind of husband's working, they're at home. They begin to look at it as, okay, what is my role in society? I want more than just my family. Love my family, but my life could be more just like my husband's. It's outside of the sphere of the home. And so they begin, what the morality of the family? What about the morality of society? And this says, the woman's sphere is, and it crosses out the home, and it says, whoever she makes good. So that kind of fits an idea that women have this responsibility for the moral upbringing of society because men are too involved with making money and greed, which of course, well, it's more complex than that, obviously, but a lot of women got involved in these so-called reform movements that all sprung up in the Industrial Revolution, the abolitionist movement. It's no coincidence that the abolitionist movement began in Great Britain with the Industrial Revolution. Abolitionist means what? Get rid of what? No? Yeah, slavery. If you weren't sure, make sure you get that down. It's anti-slavery. 
Temperance, women drinking. Prison reform, there's a big movement of prison reform. Women got involved in that. But they look at it like, wait, we're doing about rights with other people. And you can see where this is going. What about our rights? Economic, legal, political rights for women. And we're fighting for the rights for other people. What about our rights? You saw a similar thing in the 1960s. So a lot of young men and women got involved in, let's say, the civil rights movement for equal rights for all, for example, uh, a war movement. And that kind of molded into the women's rights movement or uh, modern feminism. So what about our rights? Well, the problem with this is if you're going to change the economic, political, legal system, the only one who can make the rules is government. Therefore, voting. <laughs> so suffrage was another term for the right to vote. And so adding the E-T-T-E-S for women only, the suffragette movement would start in Great Britain, but then the United States would follow. The push for voting rights first with the idea that women could vote, then these rules could be changed for a more equitable society, they would argue. This is from the 1890s, but I'm sure how long this slide was going to be. And three of the most important leaders, Lucretia Mott, Brilliant person, very well organized. She, more than anyone else, would begin the um, uh, would begin to organize the first women's rights conference. And we'll kind of have to bounce back and come back to this. Her best friend was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who another brilliant person, very intelligent, charming. And you got to be charming to organize the movement. Mott was very intense. She was focused. Uh, Stanton. And unlike Mott Stanton had a, a very loving family relation, very loving husband. Uh, poor, poor Lucretia Mott did not. But it showed that you know this was the complexities of this. And then somebody started very young, uh, basically idolized Stanton, followed the, in the footsteps of Mott, was Susan B. Anthony. And she would spend the rest of her life, the rest of the century, fighting for voting rights. And that is why the 19th Amendment in 1920 would be called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. And one of the great achievements, but also showing how difficult it's going to be, was Lucretia Mott would organize the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. Seneca Falls in upstate New York, it's no coincidence, all these religious revivals and a number of religions are going to be starting. Some would become very prominent, some would fade away. But at the same time, abolitionist movement and women's rights movement. And in the opening statement or declaration of sentiments, it would say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And that is directly quoting, except for a couple words, what document? Yeah, that Declaration of Independence. So it, it laid out that we represent or the idea that all men and women are equal and the only way to get it is through suffrage. And this would become a law, and it's kind of shocking how long it's going to be. 72 years until at least at the national level. Now, states could allow women to vote. States could allow women to vote. Montana would allow women to vote in 1914. And we will come back to this. What was the first state to allow women to vote? The first territory was Wyoming. Being in the West and shortage of people kind of makes sense. What do you know the first state? Literally just became a state and allowed women to vote. Be another Western state, the Utah. And you also notice mostly the women here is Moth, they're Stanton. But a few men came, most of the men were involved in the abolitionist movement. Most prominent would be Frederick Douglass. Man who ran away from the brutality of slavery to become one of the leaders of the abolitionist movement. So men will come back to women will come back to. Them. But also democracy. Democracy is going to come back, come out of this. The first major democratic movement, mass movement, will come out of this. We're talking mass, at least of white men. I know one baby step at a time. Now remember, this is a Republican form of government. Our constitution was written to limit who's sovereign, but more and more people as the economy changed were asking who is sovereign? 
Who has the power? Where is the question mark? But who has the power? And this, every single country that began the Industrial Revolution would do this. Britain, France, Germany, you name it. But China really began to industrialize in the 70s and 80s. There would be a massive movement for democracy. They crushed it and created a horrific police state. Now it's the most horrific state I can think of. Capitalism also meant that the economy is much more important or much more complex. And if the economy is more complex, government is going to be more important than ever before. Because government is going to have to set the rules and regulations for the economy, create the currency, control the banking system. Government is going to be more important. And remember, boss fair economics was no, no messing with competition. But they wanted government aid. So government is more important. And more people are urban. If you're living on top of each other, you need rules. If you're spread out, you just don't have as much contact. Government is by, by default more necessary. Everything from fire regulations to housing control. You know, we're going to live on places that are going to be relatively safe for people. Rules. So government is more important and the vast inequality. So they already set up a system, and this was done by or on purpose, where the elite has control of the Constitution. Remember, there's only one part of the US government that's elected by the people. And so if wealth is becoming more unequal, they have even more power. So there's going to be a massive pushback against them. Massive. And also, Workers are saying, we're stuck in this system. We want more rights on the workplace, like the labor union. All of these are movements for more power with the people. Thus, it's no coincidence. The most prominent politician of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution was somebody who said he's standing up for farmers and workers who are being left behind. And I want to be clear about it. He's talking white men here. But all white men, and that's and that's Andrew Jackson. Boy, did he hate the, the wealthy and the capitalists and those who had wealth. He yeah, pretty well with nothing. He started out with nothing. He despised inherited wealth, despised the way wealth was focusing to the top. This is from 1879, but here's Andrew Jackson asking people to vote. No concept is look at all these people coming to vote. Now, this is also 1879. So in the, the last legs of the euphoria of the Civil War, they have white men, but you also notice one black man. Well, that wasn't Jackson. Jackson was also a slave owner. But Jackson also represents so many of the complexities of American society, all wrapped up into one. So, religious upheaval. Capitalism created such massive changes. The wage system, new economic system, this is one of these tent revivals. And wherever there's massive change, there's insecurity. Whenever there's insecurity, there's always upheaval in religion. Old religions and old beliefs, old faiths began to seem like almost inadequate, and new religions would form up, or religions that existed would make radical changes. We see that with virtually almost every religion. And almost every time, and you can see it throughout American history, you saw in the 1740s, we see it throughout this entire decade, you really see it like the 1920s, you see it again in the 1950s, 1970s and 80s. Now, there's some uh, uh, reconstructionist religions movements are, are, are happening right now, and this happens almost every time. Now, there was a series of churches that they adapted in a different way. They called themselves liberal churches, meaning the idea is more individual liberty, more months. The people of the church will have the choice of their own salvation. They accepted it. They called this new capitalistic world like the new science empiricism, math and science, this new technology. But they said there is a loving God in everybody through their own personal connection with God can find salvation. And amazingly, you saw the same thing in, uh, in Islam. The same thing was happening. It's, 
it's every religion. So it does we're talking Christianity here because ninety-eight percent of the population of the United States at this time were Christians. Tomorrow we'll finish this. Please look at this. I covered a lot. By the way, do you know some of the stuff of the family I covered? Because you got a lot of things for essays, right? See, ya, have a good day. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. If you want me to look at your thesis statements, you can send it on Teams. Did I tell you that already? Yeah. Oh. I told I forgot I told you. I know I told one of my classes. Oh yeah, because we talked about why for some reason it's 24 hours. Which one of you was putting bad stuff on Teams? Which one of you? Well, oh, I, I know what happened. Uh, one here is the right to so yeah. Oh, so she must have known, must have been in her, her class. No, it's the middle school. Oh, it's the middle I, school. Guys are now banned from starting to be sad girls, so we're not working on five years. And you're part of the girl who can't start it. You want to do the great stuff, so you get close. You see, close. Those schoolers can't really keep it back in, so now we're all going to drink. Yeah, let's see it. Thank you. Quiz? Yep. Okay. Which one are we uh, check for? Not check for folks. Whatever. Chapter 12, okay. I think I got that out. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. You can write on this one. I'll try and need to take a straight one. Yeah, because I don't need the copies anymore. And my printer started to run out of ink, so. Can you read it okay? Mm -hmm. Can you read it okay? Yeah. So that's what happened. I purposely tried to avoid it, but now I know. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Everyone can be idiots, but but boys are kind of socialized to be really stupid. No offense, but these use uh, the teams that they like you know the school can see. Or they just not realize that's coming. Um you'd be shocked how many people want to get caught. They want someone to notice them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. True. It's it's sad, but that makes it even more sad. Ooh. I have a lot today. Oh, 
we're still filming. 